Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. If you wouldn't mind going ahead and having a, a seat. We'll go ahead and get started. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, one of our retina surgeons is with us today who will be speaking, Dr. Hartnett. And uh, this should be a very interesting topic uh, for us all, but I think it will be a great review for the residents as well. She'll be talking about retinopathy of prematurity from both the clinical and laboratory aspect. Thank you, Candon. Um, all right. So um, I have no relevant financial disclosures, and I may be discussing uh, about Avastin as it relates to a new clinical trial. So um, in this talk, I'd like to first uh, give a definition on how we classify and manage retinopathy of prematurity, and then discuss a little bit about how we've come to recognize that ROP is really a complex disease having both, well, having environmental, genetic, and perhaps epigenetic associations. And then I'm going to discuss a little bit about research findings in our laboratory and end with a new clinical trial that's exciting, combining uh, pediatric ophthalmology and pediatric retina uh, in a multicenter uh, fashion. So retinopathy of prematurity is the, one of the leading causes of childhood blindness worldwide. It, it only occurs in preterm infants. Full-term infants do not develop ROP, although there are conditions that look like ROP in full-term infants, like familial exudative vitreal retinopathy. It's thought that in the United States, about 16,000 preterm infants develop ROP yearly. And even with our management strategies, the numbers are still similar that approximately 550 still become blind. Our goal is to prevent stage five ROP, or total retinal detachment. And this is a, a picture of a, an eye with stage five ROP. So here's the iris and the posterior synechia. And although it looks like there's a cataract, the lens is clear, it's that there's a retrolental fibrous membrane behind which is a total retinal detachment. So first classification, how do we classify ROP? So based on a number of uh, studies, mainly the international classification of retinopathy of prematurity, we use several parameters, the zone, the stage, the presence of plus disease, and in, in the past, the extent of stage, although that's become less important with time. Um, so the zone, it gives an idea of, I think of it as how mature the retinal vascular development has become. Um, vessels start to pour out, or precursors develop uh, into vessels from the optic nerve at about 16 weeks gestation, and then move out toward the aura serrata. So zone one is considered a circle centered around on the optic nerve, and the radius is twice the distance between the optic nerve and the macula. Zone two is also centered on the optic nerve, a circle the radius of which is the distance from the optic nerve to the nasal aura serrata. And zone three is the temporal crescent. The stages of ROP are how severe it is. And it's really, um, usually we think of it as the appearance between the vascular and avascular retina. So these are RETCAM images of, a hu of human infants. These are all different infant eyes. And showing the optic nerve here, this is a left eye, the macula, immature vessels growing out. And then we see just a faint line here, an avascular retina, that's stage one. Stage two, we see some uh, volume developing along that line, avascular retina peripherally. Stage three, we have this blood vessel growth into the vitreous, intravitreous neovascularization. And stage four can be partial retinal detachment, either involving the fovea in stage 4B or, or missing the fovea in stage 4A. And as I mentioned, stage five was total retinal detachment. Now, I wanted to put this slide up to discuss the, the differences. We often hear about animal models of retinopathy of prematurity and then human retinopathy of prematurity. The animal models are all limited. Uh, first of all, they're not in preterm infants or preterm animals. They're in uh, full-term full animals. And none of the animal models develop what we see in stage four or stage five retinopathy of prematurity. 
So uh, in the human, we really think of two phases. We have this vascular phase where we have severe retinopathy of prematurity. We have blood vessel growth into the vitreous. We have something called plus disease, which is a dilation and tortuosity of the vessels. Currently, that's a qualitative assessment based on our memory of, a, of an image from multicenter clinical trials as to whether or not the severity of dilation and tortuosity makes true plus disease. So this is what most of the animal models are mimic, and we rarely get into the fibrovascular form of ROP, where the blood vessels start to play less of a role, and we start to see um, uh, vitreous membranes and preretinal membranes that cause traction on the retina and pull the retina off into retinal detachment, and that's shown here uh, in stage four ROP. Um, so. The, the uh, fibrovascular phase, we really don't have any way of, of modeling that in animals. And so most of what we know is based on our experience in human infants. So um, the, after the fire, so we have the stages, and I think back on the, the first slide where I was showing the stages, I presented the four stages. Uh, stage four ROP is when the fibrovascular phase starts where retinal detachment occurs. And this just gives an idea of what actually occurs because we often look at images like this. This is a RETCAM image of an infant eye um, showing some di dilation and tortuosity of the veins, the veins being pulled to this elevated area. This is actually retina that's pulled up into a fold, and this white area is fibrous tissue. So a cross section might look like this. So we see how the fibrous membranes pull the retina off. And how we know when we're looking at a flat two-dimensional image is that the uh, vessels around the optic nerve appear out of focus when we're focused on the fibrous membrane here that's elevated. And then stage five ROP, as I mentioned, which is total retinal detachment. So here is an example. This is the example I showed in the first slide, the white membrane behind which is a total retinal detachment. So this would be if we were to take an ultrasound through the eye or could look through the eye with x-ray vision, this is kind of what we would see. So a total retinal detachment. And even with the ability to reattach the retina surgically, the visual acuity in these infants is often very poor you know, less than 2,200, less than legal blindness. And so we do everything possible to try to prevent this. So what is our current management of retinopathy of prematurity? Um, so retinopathy of prematurity, as I said, develops only in preterm infants. It develops after birth. And there are certain characteristics that put a preterm infant at greater risk of developing severe ROP. In the United States, based on a number of studies, we found that infants born less than or equal to 1,500 grams or less than or equal 30 weeks gestation are the ones at high risk for developing some ROP. Uh, also, any infants that fall outside these parameters but have an unstable course. So basically, anyone that the neonatologists feel are at risk, either high oxygen, um, not feeding well, um, uh, lots of in infections, those, uh, any time that there's an infant that there's some concern about, poor postnatal weight gain, we will take a look and screen uh, these infants. ROP develops after birth, and we don't have any symptoms from the preterm infant to clue us in to look at their eyes. So we automatically do examinations at between four to six weeks chronologic age or 31 weeks postmenstrual age, and the postmenstrual age is the sum of the chronologic and gestational age in weeks. So for example, if you had a 24-week gestational age baby who was about four months old or 16 weeks gestation, that baby would be 40 weeks post-menstrual age. And it's, th so when you say the first exam is four to six weeks chronologic or 31 weeks, well, which is it? <laughs> it's the older of the two. So if you had a 23-week gestational age baby, who was six weeks old, so therefore 29 weeks postmenstrual age, you would wait an additional two weeks to examine that baby. And all this is based on studies and information that we've gotten from multicenter trials. Now these parameters differ in other areas of the world where ROP occurs in infants born at, at larger uh, 
birth weights or at older gestational ages. So screening occurs, they do screening at earlier time points. Then based on the examination, we do follow-up examinations, and these can be every one to two weeks. And uh, we do this until retinal, uh, retinal development is complete, so beyond zone three to the aura serrata, or until severe retinopathy of prematurity occurs. And severe retinopathy of prematurity is stage three ROP uh, with plus disease or s stage two and uh, I'll show you some of the early or some of the parameters that we use for that now. If severe ROP occurs, laser treatment is performed and the patients are followed very carefully for regression of the neovascular or the vascular components of ROP. If the vascular components persist, we do more laser. If fibrovascular components start to develop, that's when we consider surgery for progressive stage four ROP. And in all these patients, when we get the retina attached, the most important thing is visual rehabilitation to make sure that the infant can see and, and see as a child. And uh, infants with um, ROP are more likely to be myopic and also to have strabismus. So it's important to work very closely with pediatric ophthalmology. So what about this, I said about severe ROP. So what is severe ROP and how did we come up with those, those terms? So in the multicenter cryotherapy trial, they, um, that was to determine whether cryotherapy to the peripheral avascular retina would reduce the risk of a bad outcome in infants with severe ROP. And so um, they, they chose a threshold of severity where there was a 50% risk of a bad outcome in that infant if nothing was done. And so that threshold ROP was basically any infant in zone one or two with stage three, that's the intravitreal ne uh, nevascularization, having five contiguous or eight total clock hours. So that's where the extent of stage comes in. And then plus disease, that dilation and tortuosity in four out of four quadrants. And it was found in that study that cryotherapy significantly reduced the risk of, of uh, uh, retinal detachment or poor outcome in infants with threshold ROP. But there were still a lot of infants that went on to develop stage uh, five ROP or did not have good vision. And so the question was, well, maybe we should go earlier. And then also around that time, we had developed the technology to deliver laser with an indirect delivery system. So in the cryotherapy study, we didn't have that ability, and that's, that's why it wasn't um, probably uh, recommended or, or tried in that study. So based on the early treatment retinopathy or prematurity study, they developed or they um, divided pre-threshold ROP into two types, type one or two, and found that type one, where there's a 15% risk of a bad outcome in natural history, that those infants did did better if they had laser treatment to the avascular retina. So this is when we now consider laser in most cases. So any infant with zone one and stage three without plus disease. And then the other two criteria have plus disease. Zone one, any ROP, or zone two, stage two or three with plus disease. And here, the definition of plus disease also changed. Plus disease was defined as two quadrants of dilated and tortuous vessels. And, and the uh, severity of the PLUS disease is not quite as severe as the picture that we know from the cryo ROP study. We prefer laser to cryotherapy. In some cases, we can't get laser in because there's blood or the, the visualization to the retina is not good. We have better tools now. Cryotherapy tends to uh, cause more inflammation to the eye and can also be associated with plaques in the macula postoperatively, and these can interfere with visual development. I want to mention another form of severe ROP that we're seeing more of, and that's aggressive posterior ROP. So the typical zone two, stage three severe ROP tends to occur around 37 weeks postmenstrual age, uh, regardless of birth weight or gestational age of the infant. Aggressive posterior ROP, however, develop, we often see that on the first or second exam. So this could be 33 to 35 weeks um, postmenstrual age. It's generally in zone one or posterior zone two. 
and there are four quadrants of plus disease. So the, the, this does not tend to um, progress through the standard stage one, stage two, stage three, but rather we look in and we see dilated tortuous vessels and this flat knee of vascularization, which can be difficult to detect. So flat knee of vascularization is right here actually. And it just looks like a brush fuzzy border. So how do we know that that's neovascularization, well, I guess we don't really accept that. When we treat these infants with, um, with laser, so say, for example, we were treating with laser up to this point, right? What happens is there's a regression, and this blood, these blood vessels tend to regress, and about 37 weeks postmenstrual age, so the time when a typical po poster, uh, or typical stage two, um, zone two, stage three ROP would develop neovascularization. We see new formation of intravitreous neovascularization into the, uh, um, into the area where the, the uh, uh, new avascular zone developed. So here just shows this was, this is actually after laser treatment. So this patient had been treated with laser here. There was an avascular area of flat neovascularization here and neovascularization then developed and new laser was placed in. So I often tell parents who have, uh, who have children with, or infants with uh, aggressive posterior ROP that the, their infant will likely need more than one laser treatment. So this is, is neovascular. And that's, that's definitely vascular activity and the best way to treat that is with laser. But then as we start to develop this progressive stage four ROP with fibrous changes. Um, so what are the features that make us think about surgery for progressive stage four ROP? There can be ridge thickening at the junction of vascular and avascular retina. Um, and I, I reviewed a number of infants who, this was years ago before we became a little more aggressive about doing lens sparing vitrectomies for these infants. And the features that I found predicted progression of stage four ROP were at six clock hours of ridge thickening at the junction of vascular and avascular retina. Any, any type of fibrovascular proliferation or vitreous condensation. And two of four quadrants of plus disease. And sometimes it appears that the plus disease comes back. So it regresses after laser and then reforms. And then others have found that any neovascularization, even in the treated areas of of the avascular zone, that's, that's another thing that should be watched and may indicate the need for um, surgery. So what surgery do we like to do in these infants? The lens is important in visual development. Uh, if we remove the lens in, in an infant, they can have a terrible aphagic amblyopia. So we always try to save the lens and the type of surgery we do is uh, a two-port lens sparing vitrectomy when at all possible. And we try to remove the vectors of vitreous that are pulling the retina off between the ridge and the anterior part of the eye, the circumferential vector here, and also the ridge to the lens. And it's important to remember that in the preterm, or in any infant, it, the pars plana pars placata region is not mature. So whereas in the adult human, we might have four millimeters of a safe zone to enter into the vitreous cavity without tearing the retina, in a new, uh, newborn full-term infant, we have 0.87 millimeters, and in the preterm infants, it's even smaller. So we're going about a half a millimeter posterior to the limbus, trying to avoid the lens and the retina. So we don't take this you know, casually. This is not an easy decision to make to operate on these infant eyes. And yet, if we wait, then this area of retina gets pulled up to the lens and it becomes virtually impossible to safely repair the retina without removing the lens. And remember also, if we get a hole in the retina in an infant eye, unlike in the adult, it's an inoperable retinal detachment often because the vitreous is not able to be mechanically removed from the retina at this point. So we, we take these decisions very seriously, and I usually ask, ask for multiple opinions to make sure that I'm keeping myself, you know, that I'm doing, that we're doing the best thing for the infant. And then as I mentioned, stage five, prevent it with careful screening, repeat examinations, and prompt treatment. 
I often, though, do offer surgery to the reattach the retina. And my reasoning is that, you know, in research, we're doing so much to um, restore vision uh, with computer chips, with various ways. We're learning more about ways that we may be able to provide hope for this infant 20 years from now uh, with vision. It, and this is especially when it's bilateral, which it often is. Um, so I, I will uh, offer various ways to anatomically reattach the retina, either with a pars placata vitrectomy, often removing the lens, or an open sky vitrectomy. And then with an open sky vitrectomy, what we do is we remove the cornea and place it into like tissue culture media. And then we get this, and then we take the lens out with a cryoprobe, and we, were, we're, we see this uh, pre-retinal membrane, and underneath it is the retina. So you have to do sharp dissection like this to remove the membrane from the retina so that you're left with the retina like this. And then we can use viscoelastic to help push back the retina. Sometimes we drain some retinal fluid and then we replace the, the same cornea. So that's, that's one of the ways that we have to treat stage five ROP, but we're always trying to prevent it because that's when our outcomes are best. So now I'm going to just start to switch to what we know about ROP and uh, then talk a little bit about what's going on in the lab. We've come to recognize that ROP is a complex disease. And what that means is that it has a number of factors that go into its pathogenesis. There are environmental associations, there are genetic associations, and we're getting more evidence that there may be epigenetic associations as well. There's a variability in risk, so ROP can manifest differently throughout the world. In India, for example, where there are not the resources to implement oxygen monitoring and uh, regulation, they often have the type of ROP that we saw in the 1940s with very high oxygen uh, induced retinopathy and um, ROP. So it's uh, almost a different type of uh, condition than what we have here. And um, they also see ROP at, at in bigger babies that are born at an older gestational age and probably for that reason because oxygen plays a strong role. Frequencies differ worldwide in Latin America and South America. ROP is one of the leading causes of visual impairment in infants, whereas in the U.S. it's not. Um, and that, again, is because people are able, to, the, the countries are able to save the preterm infants, and they may have variability in regulating and monitoring oxygen. There may be other reasons as well, prenatal care, nutrition. Environmental associations that we know uh, are affecting, that can affect ROP, oxygen, we've seen that. I just mentioned how it differs throughout the world. Oxidative stress, maybe, uh, I'll go through that briefly. And then nutrition is being recognized as a, an important factor in the risk of ROP. And then there are genetic associations. At least one paper suggested that 70% of the variance was due to gen genetics but we don't have any strong candidate genes yet, and we want to be able to study genetics for that reason. So what about the role of oxygen? So in the United States, there was the initial ROP epidemic of the 1940s that was really associated with unregulated oxygen at birth. And uh, when it became uh, recognized through really animal models that oxygen was the culprit, oxygen was restricted, which reduced ROP, but then there was a higher uh, incidence of infant mortality and cerebral palsy. And then over the decades, there was the technology for oxygen monitoring and regulation. And so with that also came greater survival of low birth weight infants. ROP virtually disappeared for a while, and then it came back to the second epidemic when we had lower and lower <laughs> uh, birth weight infants and younger gestational age infants in the 90s. And it became recognized that other oxygen stresses uh, were important in ROP besides hyperoxia birth. For example, fluctuations in oxygen, that was a high risk for ROP, and perhaps supplemental oxygen uh, uh, during the course of the, uh, the infant's time in the NICU. What about oxidative stress? Well, oxidative stress has long been linked to ROP based on oxygen levels. So high oxygen can increase reactive oxygen species, by donating electrons to oxygen and causing superoxide radical. But it's also been argued that low oxygen levels can uh, increase reactive oxygen species generation because um, it, it tends to slow down the electron transport chain and you end up with more electron donors. So, so hypoxia may also increase ROS. 
And then the fluctuations with ischemia reperfusion may also increase ROS. And in the preterm infant, uh, the infant is uh, in utero, oxygen is about 30 to 40 millimeters mercury. And so when the infant is born and is placed into, sometimes they were put into 100% oxygen at the time of birth, that was definitely hyperoxia. And so it's not clear if that plays a role, but it may. Um, the infants have been measured for oxidative compounds, and they're found to have higher oxidative compounds when they're preterm than full-term infants. There's also reduction in antioxidative enzymes. They don't have the reserve to be able to, to uh, handle oxidative stress. And in a uh, meta-analysis from a number of studies done uh, decades ago on trying vitamin E to reduce the risk of of ROP, they found when they put all the numbers together, they found that there was reduced stage three uh, in those infants with vitamin E. But I think vitamin E has risks, and that's why it's not currently being being used. I think those trials were stopped. The role of nutrition: there have been a number of studies done in the last decade that have found that low serum insulin-like growth factor. Uh, is associated with poor postnatal weight gain in preterm infants and also with larger avascular areas of retina and severe ROP. And so in Sweden, they developed a reference model based on weekly IGF-1 levels in the serum and safe postnatal weight gain for infants without ser uh, severe ROP. And then they used this, um, and whenever the infant's parameters fell beyond what their uh, numbers were, uh, each week, an alarm went off. And so they, they then correlated the number of times of the alarms with those infants that went on to develop severe ROP. And they found 100% sensitivity in Sweden, but it's not been uh, generally this, um, found to be as valuable in other areas of the world, but it's still valuable, 90% of Brazil. And there have been several studies in the United States, but they've been retrospective. And the goal is to do a prospective study to test this. So why do this? Because what's happening, especially in these countries that have so much ROP without the oxygen regulation and monitoring, is that they don't have enough people to do the examination. And a lot of infants that don't develop severe ROP need examination. So how do they best use the resources? And this is one, one um, um, model that's being tested. As I mentioned in genetics, there's a retrospective study of monozygotic and dizygotic twins that 70% of the variance in susceptibility to ROP is due to genetic factors alone, but no one gene strongly is associated with increased risk. And I'm working with Meg DeAngelis here um, and, we, and with Khan Yost and uh, with the neonatology and pediatric ophthalmology and to uh, be able to determine um, genetics in ROP. We've looked at, at studies done so far. There have been a number of candidate genes, but there really has not been one candidate gene that's been found to be like a complement factor H in AMD. So nothing that really stands out as being um, helpful yet. And then I'll just briefly mention about epigenetic factors. Um, so epigenetics can be things like uh, if, the, if the DNA, if the proteins around the DNA, the histones, are sh uh, interfere with the ability of having the gene transcribed, then that gene will not be able to be translated into protein. Um, and what's been found is that intrauterine growth restriction can lead to dysregulation of angiogenic factors based on differences in ma being male or female. Rob Lane is doing a lot of this work in multi in multiple um, organs, and we're collaborating with him to look in the retina as well. In humans, IUGR can increase the risk of diabetes later and obesity, and risk can seem to be passed on to later generations. We found in the retina that IUGR had a variability in the regulation of retinal IGF-1, IGF-1 receptor, and VEGF receptor 1 based on sex, and we're doing more studies with this right now. I don't have enough to be able to even conclude and tell you what it means. Okay, so I'm going to switch now and talk a little bit about what's going on in our laboratory. Um, some of this I've presented uh, briefly before, uh, and some of it is new. So, so the way that we think about ROP is, is based on the avascular retina, because that's a risk for severe ROP. It's a risk for intravitreal neovascularization. 
and it's long been so thought to be the source of angiogenic factors. Um, so based on what we see in nature, we've developed a mental model of what goes on in ROP, in that when a baby is born preterm, the, av the peripheral retina is avascular. Now, 90% of these will vascularize their avascular retina and be fine and never develop ROP. But 10% will develop a severity of ROP where there's intravitreous neovascularization. Even if we look at this group and look at the natural history, 50% will have regression of neovascularization with ongoing vascularization of avascular retina. So we know that that's possible. And that's been our goal from the start, is that we, we're not interested in just inhibiting neovascularization, but we want to redirect the blood vessel growth appropriately. And as I mentioned, ROP is complex. There are genetic and environmental factors involved. So we have different models based on what the question is that we're trying to answer. So the, for genetics, the hyperoxy-induced vasoobliteration model that was developed by Lois Smith and Pat DeMori is probably the most um, well-known. And in this, mice are brought at postnatal day seven into uh, high constant oxygen for five days and then placed into room air following that. And although these oxygen levels create arterial oxygen levels that are not consistent with what preterm infants develop, I mean, it's probably like over 300 millimeters mercury, but it does develop, uh, it's, it is still a very useful model for studying uh, genetic, um, um, genetic mechanisms because you can use, use transgenic animals. The retinal flat mound here shown uh, lectin stained when we flatten the retina, it comes out looking like a clover leaf because the retina is round. Uh, we see central obliterated retina and then these endothelial buds in the vasculature. So it doesn't really look like ROP either, but it's a very useful model. The model, the 5010 fluctuating model, was developed by John Penn, and the supplemental oxygen part of it was added by Bruce Berkowitz. And in this, rat pups are placed into 50% oxygen for 24 hours and then cycled down to 10% oxygen for 24 hours. This cycling is continued to day 14 when they're brought up from 10% into 21% or 28% oxygen. So these uh, oxygen extremes create arterial oxygen levels in the rat that are similar to transcutaneous oxygen levels in a human infant that develops severe ROP. It also has fluctuation in oxygen, which is more similar to what the preterm infant experiences. And the retinal flat mount has the appearance more similar to severe ROP with the peripheral avascular retina and this intravitreous nevascularization at the junction. So um, we mentioned about angiogenic factors being important in intravitreous neovascularization, and certainly one of the ones that has become recognized as very important is vascular endothelial growth factor. Um, it's associated with severity of a number of adult and uh, infant diseases. It's regulated by oxygen, and that's relevant in the preterm infant. And if we inhibit the bioactivity of VEGF, we can reduce the severity of disease, and this includes ROP. But VEGF is essential to retinal vascular development, and, and therefore we have to remember that um, inhibiting it might have an, an adverse effect on the v developing vasculature because it is an angiogenic inhibitor. So in the first part, I'm going to show you some of the work we did to determine the effect of relevant oxygen stresses on expression of VEGF to gain insight into the development of avascular retina and subsequently intravitreous neovascularization. So we used a number of outcomes. We, we can take whole retinas out and we can measure protein by Western blot and we can measure uh, the uh, mRNA by using real-time PCR. But we can also measure several parameters uh, in the retinas themselves. So this is from a postnatal 14 room air raised rat pup. This is the retina flattened, stained with lectin, showing that the retina is fully vascularized in the inner plexus. Um, in the 5010 OIR model at postnatal day 14, there would be about 33% avascular retina uh, in the flat mount. At postnatal day 18 in the 5010 OIR model, we see that there's characteristic avascular retina, about 25%, and we see that almost, if we were to measure by clock hours, there are almost 12 clock hours of intravitreal neovascularization. And, and I'll also mention that in this model, there's always regression of disease. So it, it gives us the opportunity to 
look at what things might be causing regression, which is what, what we'd like. So uh, we first measured the uh, VEGF mRNAs and protein in room air and 5010 OIR model at different postnatal day ages to find out the association of the EGF with avascular retina and intravitreal neovascularization. Now I'll mention that in the mouse model, when the animals are in high oxygen and they have vasoobliteration in the central retina, the EGF is very low in the retina. And then when they have endothelial budding into the vitreous, the EGF is very high. So we thought, well, maybe since we are uh, in the rat model and we're going from low oxygen at 10% to high oxygen at 21%, maybe we would see a similar pattern. But we didn't find that. So here is VEGF 164, which is the most prevalent mRNA. And um, we found this is fold change in expression relative to beta actin. And using an ANOVA that uh, accounts for multiple comparisons, we found that both older developmental age as well as the model compared to room air were significantly associated with increased VEGF 164. And then when we looked at the protein, we had a similar relationship, and there were also several um, significant uh, days uh, based on post hoc protected T test uh, evaluation, including postnatal day 14 when avascular retina persisted in the model but room air um, retinas were fully vascularized, and at postnatal day 18 when the vascularization was present in the model. So in a summary, VEGF was increased at postnatal day 14 in the model when a vascular retina w existed compared to room air. So this is a little different than what we saw in the mouse model. It was also increased at P18 when intravitreal neovascularization uh, was present. So then we asked the question whether if we inhibited the bioactivity of VEGF, would we reduce intervitreal neovascularization, but would it also cause persistent avascular retina or maybe even more avascular retina since VEGF is important in retinal development? And we found that neutralizing VEGF reduced clock hours of neovascularization. So this is with a um, neutralizing antibody to VEGF, so similar to Avastin but not Avastin, and an IgG control. And we found that it did not interfere with avascular retina. So more avascular retina is high on this slide. And then when we used a receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor for VEGF receptor 2, which is the angiogenic receptor, we found a similar uh, pattern that there was a significant reduction, this time area of intravitreal neovascularization, but it did not interfere with ongoing retinal vascular development. So that was a little bit unexpected. And you know, based on what we were getting, I was, we wondered, gee, could VEGF, VEGF receptor 2 signaling actually contribute to avascular retina? So is too much VEGF causing avascular retina? And so how could that be? So we went back to what occurs in vascular development. And when, when endothelial cells divide, they undergo mitosis, they set up a cleavage plane, and the angle between the cleavage plane and the long axis of the vessel predicts where the daughter endothelial cells will migrate, such that a 90-degree angle predicts vessel elongation, a zero-degree angle predicts vessel widening, and perhaps we thought that if you had a lot of ir um, irregular angles, that maybe it would cause uh, disoriented mitoses in sort of a pattern like what we see in intravitreal neovascularization. So studying the EGF is challenging because a single allele or either receptor knockout is lethal. So we went, we collaborated with Vicki Bouch, who has an embryonic stem cell model at the University of North Carolina, and she has a VEGF receptor 1 knockout. So what that does, VEGF receptor 1 can bind to VEGF, but it doesn't have a very strong receptor tyrosine kinase to signal cell events, and it binds the VEGF, keeping it from VEGF receptor 2. So when we knock it out, all the VEGF goes into VEGF receptor 2 and we get increased VEGF receptor 2 signaling. And indeed, we found that this caused disoriented mitoses uh, in the embryonic stem cell model, and it was similar to the appearance of what we see with intravitreal neovascularization. And further, it could be rescued with a soluble FLT1, that's VEGF receptor 1, the soluble form, transgene, linked to a promoter that was specific for endothelial cells. So we took it back to the model, and we asked the question whether or not uh, VEGF, uh, if we neutralized the bioactivity, if we could reduce uh, some of the tortuosity or disorientation of the 
dividing endothelial cells. And so this, we used a neutralizing antibody to VEGF, and we took lectin stayed flat mounds. Here is the cleavage plane, measured cleavage angles. And then on this graph, this is a number of mitoses, and these are the angles, the cleavage angles, grouped by 10 degrees. And just to give a uh, sort of a summary that the elongation would be toward 90 degrees, dilation would be toward zero degrees. And we found that in veins, that the neutralizing antibody tended to cause the veins to be less dilated than the IgG control. And when we looked at arterial tortuosity using the sort of a, a pre-version of ROP tool, um, we found that the neutralizing antibody significantly reduced arterial tortuosity compared to control or to the non-injected. So we've We've, so far, we've found that increased VEGF receptor 2 signaling disorders dividing vascular cells and contributes to dilation and tortuosity and may have an effect in PLUS disease. And now we're studying in the lab whether excess VEGF would disorder normal developmental angiogenesis and contribute to avascular retina by permitting endothelial cells to divide outside the plane of the retina and proliferate in a pattern that looks like intravitreal neovascularization. And the clinical studies have provided support for the hypothesis in that anti-VEGF does reduce intravitreal nevascularization and permits ordered angiogenesis, but long-term and safety results are lacking and more studies are warranted. So, um, you know, I don't... Okay, I think, are we okay? We can go for 10 minutes? Okay. So, um, so I've just, we have, this is our current working hypothesis for the lab, and we sh just showed that VEGF receptor 2 signaling leads, leads to some, dis or we're studying disordered angiogenesis, which, which increases avascular retina. Some of this I've presented before, but now I want to go through another mechanism because it's, avascular retina is going to have multiple mechanisms. There's not going to be one bullet that, that cures it. And so, um, I'm going to take you through this pathway where we find that VEGF receptor signaling actually activates the jack stack pathway and contributes to avascular retina. This is the work of Haibo Wang, uh, who's a research associate in our lab, and also a number of uh, uh, people in my lab. So the signal transducers and activators of transcription, STAT, and cytokine activation, uh, these um, are this is an important pathway whereby you have a cytokine receptor with two of these uh, jacks. A cytokine can activate and then cause stats to form a dimer, and they can translocate into the nucleus, and then either uh, with uh, stimulators or repressors affect transcription of genes. And the cytokine growth factor can be interf erythropoietin, interferon, interleukins, possibly others, growth factors like the EGF. And it can also be activated by hypoxia, reactive oxygen species, or supplemental oxygen. So it seemed like a good pathway to study. And our hypothesis was that JAK-STAT signaling would contribute to avascular retina through either apoptosis or death of endothelial cells or by affecting growth factor expression, such as VEGF. So we first looked at the, uh, so uh, when STAT3 is, is activated, it becomes phosphorylated. So JAK-STAT goes through STAT3 and can be phosphorylated. So we first looked at the amount of phosphorylated STAT3 in retinas in room air and in the model at postnatal day 14 when avascular retina was present. And basically we found that the model had increased phosphorylated STAT3 compared to room air. And this is just, just showing uh, the, the Western blots. Um, furthermore, we could use a chemical, uh, JEX, uh, JAK2, JAK3 inhibitor, and we found that it significantly reduced phosphorylated STAT3 when we gave it as an intraperitoneal injection into these animals. We also found that when we use this inhibitor and inhibited STAT3, it reduced the area of avascular retina in the ROP model. So STAT3 activation or phosphorylation contributed to avascular retina, and so then we wanted to set out to understand the mechanisms. Could it be affecting downstream VEGF expression? So if you, um, that, uh, that would then lead to avascular retina, um, either by 
uh, inhibiting uh, VEGF or could it be causing apoptosis? So in this case, we use the model at postnatal day 14 and we use AG490, which inhibits STAT3 versus PBS control, but we found that there was no effect on either VEGF or on cleave caspase 3, which is downstream of, of two of the um, apoptotic pathways. So it didn't seem to uh, be caused by either of the mechanisms that we thought. So then we started to think about erythropoietin because it's been neural, it's shown to be neuroprotective, it can be thrombogenic, it can protect against hyperoxia induced avascular retina in the mouse model of uh, hyperoxia induced vaso obliteration. But there have been studies where use of erythropoietin has been associated with severe ROP in preterm infants. So there's controversy as to its role in ROP. So we um, first measured erythropoietin in animals in the 5010 OIR model treated with either AG490 or PBS, and we found that when we inhibited STAT3 that we had increased erythropoietin. And here I'm just kind of um, showing you what the signaling pathway might be. So JAK stat seems to lead to decreased erythropoietin. And so then we asked, well, is VEGF involved? Because we know that VEGF is important. So we looked at animals that were treated with a neutralizing antibody to VEGF at a dose that we knew decreased intravitreal neovascularization or control, and we measured uh, phosphorylated STAT3. And what we found is that in the neutralizing antibody to VEGF, there was a significant reduction in uh, phosphorylated STAT3 compared to the IgG injection. And these are intravitreal uh, injections, and the way we do these experiments is we, we don't inject the fellow eye to look for crossover effect. So this suggested that VEGF was upstream of JAK-STAT in this model. And we took these same eyes and probed for erythropoietin, and we found that the neutralizing antibody increased VEGF, so this looked like VEGF was activating JAK-STAT to cause decreased erythropoietin. And then finally, we injected erythropoietin into the 5010 OIR model compared to control, and we found that it reduced avascular retina. So that's where we are right now, and we're studying uh, in vitro, um, we're using it in um, models of endothelial cells and Mueller cells to get at mechanisms. But STAT3 does seem to be activated in, uh, after fluctuating oxygen in the rat model at postnatal day 14 when avascular retina persists. Uh, it contributes to avascular retina and VEGF appears to be upstream of uh, STAT3. Uh, and then it's STAT3 signaling seems to reduce erythropoietin and this is associated with avascular retina. So uh, our current working hypothesis is that VEGF fluctuations in oxygen may activate Jack Street to decrease erythropoietin in the retina and lead to avascular retina. So our ongoing studies, um, anti-VEGF is not the only answer. Additional clinical studies are warranted. Uh, there we had a grand rounds here talking about a clinical trial using Avastin um, in infants with severe ROP compared to laser. So we need more clinical studies done. Erythropoietin may increase intravitreous neovascularization in models, but it depends on the timing, apparently, that it's given. And when we, uh, um, STAT3 activation in our model reduced erythropoietin, we think that perhaps neuro, the neuroprotective effect of erythropoietin may be beneficial, though, um, in ROP by promoting vascular retina if it's given earlier. So all these things we are studying. Um, and it may mean that ROP is something that will require multiple drugs to, uh, uh, to treat it. And the, the update on the clinical trial is probably the most exciting thing is that pediatric ophthalmology and pediatric retina are coming together to form a multicenter clinical trial to study Avastin uh, versus laser in severe ROP. And we'll be using uh, photographs, too, to be able to characterize the severity of ROP rather than um, uh, just mental images of what we see when we examine the infants. And then I wanted to acknowledge our funding sources and also the people in my laboratory who have done all this work. This is Yanchao Zhang, Shami Kanakar, Manabu McCloskey, Haibo Wang, Tyler Smith, and Eichi Nishimura. Thank you. And any questions? 
Yes. I well, I think I think that could be the case. I mean, we're still, you know, it's it's evolving. Um, um, ROP infants are younger and smaller, and then new new medications are being used for other complications that they have. So it is kind of a an evolving field, and and I think what you're saying is 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 very accurate and and perhaps what we need is to have multiple tools kind of to be able to target this and figure out what's safe and what's not safe yeah Can you give me an example of what the infant is being used for? yes no no that in fact we those studies we gave in intraperitoneal to the pups um, and usually I don't know is it given how do you give it in infants is it sub Q? So it's not, but it dip probably, you know, the, the studies that showed severity were retrospective studies. And I always question that because it's when do you take the infant? If the infant, you know, maybe those infants, had they had EPO, um, would have lived. You know, it might be those questions. So when you'd say, well, we're going to look at all infants that have survived to the time when they have ROP examinations, you're taking out a number of infants who may have died because they didn't have EPO. I mean, so it, I think that it depends on how the trial. Yeah. The study. Yes. Anemia prematurity, um, and I don't know about any, are there other reasons that, we have our uh, neonatal group here that came too as well, thank you. Do, uh, besides anemia prematurity, do you give it for brain? Mm -hmm. Right, I know of, of one study, I think it may have been retrospective, just by looking in the literature, that EPO was associated, when, when infants had EPO, they had better cognitive scores or better mental development scores later on when they were children. And I think that in Europe, are they starting a study for EPO on preterm infants? I, I thought I heard that, but I couldn't find it on, on the PubMed, so. But I think it would be a good, I mean, uh, the, I think what would be interesting is to do EPO and then if they get severe ROP, anti-VEGF, because you'd, maybe the EPO would be neuroprotective. Um, we should try that in our model. And, um, n and may not cause some of the, the problems that we're concerned about with avastin into the vitreous, which then gets systemic. It may have a negative effects on other organs. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I don't know, maybe I should have you. Uh, d Thank you.